Welcome to the Radiant Visalia podcast. Join us at one of our two services, 9 a.m. and 1045 a.m. Download the Church Center app or visit our website, radiantvisalia.com, to stay connected with us. All right, enjoy. today and um, my knees start jumping a little bit and adrenaline starts taking over and I realize like um, I think I've felt this before and um, I used to play a little indoor soccer back when I was a younger mom and um, before the game it would be like knees jumping up and down adrenaline taking over it's like sitting on the sideline waiting for the game to start and I felt like the Lord just um, said to me, it's game time. And I just love that about the Lord because he just speaks to me things that I can relate to. And to me, that just said everything like, okay, God, we got this. You know, we're in the game. We're going to do this. And it is game time. So jump in with me. We're going to play some soccer today and in God's way. So I guess the first part of this game is I have to tell you what I'm going to add to the song list. So the first song is Johnny Be Good, Who Doesn't Like Chuck Berry. Go ahead, Richard. song is fun to me because that reminds me of a carload of girls driving around with the windows down, playing the radio, waiting for a good song to come on. And um, if Johnny Be Good came on, it was either dancing in the car or pulling the car over and dancing in the street. So, that, boy, those were good days, right? So the next song that um, I'm going to add to the song list, I'm a little bit um, older now, and um, this is You Put this, Your Love in My Heart by Keith Green. I found it hard to believe someone like you cared for me. You put this love in my heart. Obviously, I'm a Christian now. <laughs> I tried but could not refuse. You gave me no time to choose. You put this love in my heart. What that looks like to me is um, a Volkswagen van, bright orange, and a really great stereo system in it, windows down, music blaring, and Keith Green playing all the time, singing at the top of our lungs, and I'm pretty sure back then we thought that we were witnessing. <laughs> we were like witnessing to people because, you know, Keith Green was the word at that time. But I realized that um, many of you guys don't really know me, and um, I've been here for about three and a half, a little over three and a half years now, and so let me just give you a, a little few bullet points of who I am. I was born in Washington State um, and um, lived in a non-Christian home. I gave my heart to the Lord when I was 19 and um, also got married when I was 19. We had two daughters, Erica, who lives in Washington State with my four granddaughters, and Janelle, who lives here. This is her and my grandchildren and her husband, Matt. And um, in the 80s, my husband, and, along with my daughters and I, we joined YWAM, which is a missions organization founded by, it's called Youth of the Mission, founded by Lauren Cunningham. And we jumped into that 
full-heartedly. We uh, boarded a ship in L.A., um, sailed the South Pacific for about a uh, year and a half. We stayed in, with YWAM for approximately 10 years where we um, did various different kinds of missionary work. Um, part of that being that we put together teams and took them out for disaster relief. And we also lived in Bogota, Colombia, where we ministered to street kids. Um, after YWAM, we went back to our hometown, Washington, and my husband went back into the trades, which um, he was a plumber, pipe fitter, and welder. And I jumped into the school district and was pretty excited to be known in the town as the lunch lady. Yeah, that's pretty fun. Little kids stopping their moms and saying, Mom, that's our lunch lady. Um, soon after doing that for a few years, we were asked by our home church to come on staff, and I took the position of church secretary and, um, and woman's director, and Bob took on janitorial and master's commission. And master's commission was um, a group of young people that he trained up to do ministry and to take them out and um, preach and teach in other churches and stuff like that. And then after, um, so when we took them out, a church in Las Vegas heard about us, and um, we, we even came here with our master's commission to history makers. And um, anyways, Las Vegas uh, asked us to come and um, put together master's commission for their church. We served that church for about three years where we then planted a church in Helena, Montana. Are you guys exhausted? Yeah. We <laughs> planted a church in Helena, Montana, and we um, ministered there for about 11 years. And then my husband was diagnosed with cancer where he quickly passed away, and I moved here to um, be in Vi Visalia and be by my daughter. Janelle. Anyways, um, I share all this because through life's journey, I have learned a few things. And one of the things that I have learned is that I take God at his word. I believe his word to be true. I believe his word to be powerful. I believe his word to be life-changing, strengthening, guiding, his word to be everything that I need in my life. I believe it to be true. I believe that when I pray, he truly turns his ear toward me, and I've got his attention. I see that, actually, when I pray. I'm like, God, come on, let's, let's get this going here. You need to be paying attention. Just like David, just like David through his life, he learned through life journeys that he could trust God. He learned through his life journey that he could call upon God. He learned that that through his life that there was a king of kings and lord of lord and it wasn't him. And um, he, so through our life's journeys, we all get to, to learn who God is as we apply the Lord to, to our situations. We're not the answer. He is. He's the answer. Last week, Jared shared um, on Psalms 4, which is sometimes labeled as the... Um, evening prayer, and this week I'm going to share on Psalms 5, which is sometimes labeled as the morning prayer, and all I have to say about that is, whatever time it is, just pray, <laughs> just, just pray, morning, evening, noontime, just as it doesn't matter, so let's go ahead and um, just go ahead and read Psalms 5 to you right now, starts out, give ear to my words, O Lord. Consider my meditation. Give heed to the voice of my cry, my King and my God. For to you I will pray. My voice you shall hear in the morning, O Lord. In the morning I will direct it to you. And I will look up. For you are not a God who takes pleasure in wickedness, nor shall evil dwell with you. The boastful shall not stand in your sight. You hate all workers of iniquity. You, d you shall destroy those who speak falsehood. The Lord abhors a bloodthirsty and deceitful man, but as for me, I will come into your house in the multitude of your mercy, in the fear of you, I will worship towards your holy temple. 
Lead me, O Lord, in your righteousness because of my enemies. Make your way straight before my face, for there is no faithfulness in their mouth. In their inward part is destruction. Their throat is an open tomb. They flatter with their tongue. Pronounce them guilty, O God. Let them fall by their own counsel. Cast them out in the multitude of their transgressions, for they have rebelled against you. But let those rejoice who put their trust in you. Let them ever shout for joy because you defend them. Let those also who love your name be joyful in you. For you, O Lord, will bless the righteous with favor. You will surround him as with a shield. In Psalms 4, we heard last week that um, there is an army, there is an enemy after David. His own son is a part of that, Absalom, and he's being pursued to be killed. These people have rebelled against the government. They have rebelled against God's ways, and they've rebelled against the king. They, they're, they're after David, and they want to kill him. And so we have David in Psalms 4 where he finds rest in the midst of the storm. In the midst of being pursued by an enemy, we, we read that David found rest in that. And when we get to Psalms 5, we see that nothing's changed. The enemy is still after him, but he does something really cool. He says, hey, Lord, would you give me your ear? Right? He says, give me your ear, Lord, and consider my meditation. There's things that are going on inside of David. There's things going in inside of me at times that maybe I can't express. But the Lord knows it. And I'm asking, and David's asking, Lord, don't only just listen to my words, but also hear what's going on inside of me. Because you're all knowing, you're all powerful. And even though I may not be able to articulate everything that's happening right now, you've got it, Lord. And I need you to consider what's what I'm meditating on as well. Give me your ear and let and hear the meditation of my heart. Um, then he also says, my king and my God. David knew that there was a king of kings and a lord of lords. He knew that he needed to line himself up and stay under the authority that was over him. He wasn't about himself, his own motives, and what he thought was right. He lined himself up with the Lord. He knows that um, the Lord doesn't like the wickedness. He knows that. So we see in verse 9 that he reminds the Lord that there's no faithfulness in their mouth. He's like, you know, Lord, now that I've got your ear, now that, you know, I know that you're hearing me, let me just remind you about this enemy who's pursuing me. I, I just love that because, you know, we can just tell God anything. Not like he doesn't already know, but let's just remind him. So he says that there is no faithfulness in their mouth. Their inward part is destruction. Like, these are bad people. This is a bad thing going on. Their throat is an open tomb. They flatter with their tongue, but we really know what's going on in their heart, right? Pronounce them guilty, O God, by their own counsel, by their own evil desires. Just pronounce them guilty. Reminding the Lord that their plans of evil should not be successful. He's just letting God know, like, let's not let them have any fruit here. Let's not let them be successful. And um, that just brings a thought to me when I lived in um, Bogota, Colombia. There was a time that our visa needed to be renewed, and so we had to leave country to do that. So we flew over to Venezuela um, to take care of that business, and we stayed at a hotel. Now, don't be thinking hotel like the Marriott. It's not like that. It's a stinky old room, and we're staying there, just trying to get our business done, right? So um, we're, we're in this room, and um, it's dinner time. We take the girls down to have dinner, and as we're eating dinner, we notice that a lot of military people have moved in. They're, you can tell a soldier, and they've got their guns, let me tell you. 
everybody in Bogota or Venezuela, they have their guns. So um, anyways, they've got their guns, they look official, they, they're, they're eating or, or whatever, but I'm thinking, why are they here? Now, I've lived in Bogota, Colombia for a little time, and I've got this thing going on inside of me like, I don't know if I really trust anybody, right? I trust the Lord, but I don't know if I trust the military, I don't know if I trust the police. You know, when the police pull you over and they tap a, their gun on your husband's chest because they want a bribe or you know that the police have shot um, one of your um, street kids. And anyways, you get this kind of like, and uh, yeah, I don't know who I trust anymore. So I've got the military moved in, and uh, we just think, this doesn't look good. Let's go back to our room. So we get the girls. We go back to our room. And as we're getting them ready for bed, I, I don't know where the mili that particular part of the military went. And then um, we hear a lot of commotion outside. I look out the curtain and, and realize now another group of military-type people have moved in. But these are guerrilla warfare military-type people. Now, all I can say is when I put that together, that isn't good. I just think, mm this does not look like a good thing's going to happen. There, this is going to be, this is not peaceful, just not peaceful. So we just stay in our room. We're like good people. And um, we realize that um, their voices outside are getting louder and louder. Bob and I are going to get ready for bed pretty soon. And we're late. We're actually in bed. We're laying there. And it's just chaos outside. Louder voices, lots of drinking, lots of partying, louder, louder, louder. Now I really know that's not a good combination. And so um, I'm laying there, and I feel like the Lord says to me, um, you need to get up and pray. And so I say to Bob, I said, um, are you asleep? He's like, no, of course not, <laughs> you know. So I said, I feel like we're supposed to get up and pray. And we get up and pray like good YWAMers know how to pray. So, because we are taught how to pray, and let me tell you, when um, we, get, we decide to pray, there is praying going on, and we believe it, and we believe in God, and we believe in who we're praying to, and we believe that the hand of the Lord is going to protect us. We believe that he's going to hold back the enemy. We believe that we've got his ear. We believe that he is for us. We, we've got his attention, just like David believed, we believed. And did this just go off? Bear with me here. And we believe. So um, all that to say about 4 o'clock in the morning, we re um, they had calmed down, and um, we had decided to go back to bed now. We go back to bed. We wake up the next morning, and we're going to check out of this hotel. And um, when we check out, the clerk in his way, in his broken English and us in our broken Spanish, we know that he decrees and declares that there is unrest in the area. I'm like, yeah, you go figure. You think so? So um, we were just real happy to get in our little taxi and go to the airport. So we jump in our taxi. We go to the airport. We're going through customs, and um, I give them the girls' passports and my passports, and we're going through, and they just, like, they're kind of cranky, you know. I don't think they like us because we're Americans, maybe, and we don't really speak their language, and they're just like, get through here, you know. And then when they went to push Bob through, um, no, they didn't let him go through. They decided to detain him. Well, there's no, there's no going back. I don't get to go back to where my husband is, I have to take my girls and go forward to um, get in line at the airport and who knows where he's gone now at this. And so I know where my help comes from. And even though I'm aware of unrest, even though I'm aware that there's an enemy, even though I'm aware of that, I know that the Lord hears the meditation of my heart. I'm not on the floor crying out to God at this point. I'm just thinking, dear Jesus, help us, right? 
I didn't really want to get on an airplane by myself. I didn't really want to leave my husband in Venezuela. So um, anyways, about an hour goes by, and here comes Bob, and he's all happy. He's smiling like nothing big has gone on for him. And he's just like happy he was interrogated and happy that he, you know, this is like his little story and God saw him through. And I'm thinking, good. Well, you know, it's a weird day that um, you're excited to fly back into Bogota, Colombia. You know, it's just like that just doesn't even make sense. But um, what I learned through these life experiences and as David had learned through his life experiences that I do have a God that hears my prayers and answers them. I do have a God that I can press into and believe him for things that look bad for him to take care of it. Now, not, you know, these are really good stories because I get my way in the end. You know, I get to have a a happy ending, God meets us, we get delivered out of Venezuela, we make it out of Bogota alive, and, um, you know, these are, these are good stories, but not every prayer ends up the way we want it to. It just doesn't always go our way, and that's the whole part about trusting God and believing in God and where our help comes from. It's not that I pray good prayers is that I serve a good God and no matter and believe that no matter what the outcome is, he is still a good God. He still hears me. He's still for me. He's still got my best at inter, in his interest. And he, he's the one that takes care of it. And so, um, um, anyways, let's move on. So in Psalms 18, 6, Another uh, Psalms that really I would have loved to preach on, but God told me to do Psalms 5, so I thought I should be obedient. But anyways, in Psalms 18, I just love that portion of Scripture. I, I would love for all of you to read it because it really um, shows the Lord in a real warrior on my behalf way. It's kind of fun to think of the Lord fighting for you, right? So it's just a great scripture. And, um, but in verse 6, it says, In my distress, I called upon the Lord and cried out to my God. How many know that to be crying out to God, you have to have some distress? Okay? So it says that there. In my distress, I called upon the Lord and cried out to my God. He heard my voice from his temple, and my cry came before him, even to his ears. Psalms 116, 1 through 3. I love the Lord because he has heard my voice and my supplications, because he has inclined his ear to me. Therefore, I will call upon him as long as I live. My heart is to call upon the Lord as long as I live. Not because I always get my way, because I have a God who hears me and is involved in my business and he loves me and he's going to give me the answers that are right for me. In June of 2012, I'll never forget the words that I heard from the Lord and I can say I heard these from the Lord because I've learned to hear his voice over these years and um, he says to me, Pam, whatever you do, keep your eyes right on me. Okay, I wasn't marching around my living room, doing a bunch of praying, waiting to hear on God. I was just getting ready for an appointment. So a couple days before that, uh, my husband, um, we noticed a lump on his hip. And um, we thought, oh, what's that? I don't know. Maybe it's a cyst or something. So a um, few days go by and I noticed that he's limping. He came home and he was limping. And now my husband, we had just climbed a mountain a few days before that. He's a man who hunts and fishes and he just, you know, he doesn't limp. I don't know. It just, I, I don't know what's going on. So he's kind of limping. I'm like, he goes, yeah, this is really painful. And I'm like, well, let's call the doctor and see what's going on. So we call the doctor it's about 4 o'clock in the evening, and 
and the doctor says, come on down, yeah, not like Visalia, that if I call the doctor a month later, you know, well, we'll see if we can get you in, okay? And then, um, so anyways, we go to this doctor, and that started this process, and um, the, he didn't know what it was, he ordered the CAT scan, and we go to a doctor the next day that was supposed to read that, they don't know what it is, and I was praying, and I was like, Lord, we don't know what this is, but I ask you to direct us to where we're, what we're supposed to do about that. Give them the answers. And this doctor, just out of the blue, says to, me, to us, I want you to go see the cancer specialist. We're like, what? We thought this was like a cyst or something, you know? And um, so that was very shocking. And uh, we go to the cancer doctor, and um, doctor's looking at all that stuff. And then he, uh, within another day, we are off to Seattle, Washington, for all kinds of testing and, and stuff. And, and there just wasn't a good day from that point on. It was every day was a bad report. Every doctor was a bad report. Everything was a bad report. Just wasn't good. But God knew what he was doing when he said to me, Pam, whatever you do, keep your eyes right on me. Because I wasn't asking him for anything, but he cares enough about me to already give me something to hold on to. So... Um, in bad reports, you can get out there a bit, you know, and I would bring myself back. Okay, Lord, what? What about this? Okay, Lord, what about that? Okay, Lord, I need your help here. Oh, Lord, could you just hold me? Right? You, and um, I just love that about God. I just love that he cared that much to give me that. So, um, Two weeks go by in Washington. We get to go back to Montana, which Bob was very excited to go back home. And we started radiation and chemo. And I really, I don't know where I was, but uh, I don't know if this was just my own survival or what, but I really didn't think my husband was dying. I really thought we were just going to do this radiation and chemo and life would go on because, you know, I had a plan. I had a plan what my life was supposed to look like. You know, I was going a certain way. We were doing a certain thing, and we were growing old together, and this is where we're heading. So um, we were home for a short time, and we're doing the chemo and the radiation. And um, one night, Bob is up throwing up violently, and it was like, ooh. This is not good. I knew in my heart this was not good. This was different. And um, so the next morning we go to radiation, and I just say to the doctor, hey, you know, Bob seemed really sick last night. This is what's going on. And he goes, okay, well, let's um, talk to the cancer doctor. So we do that, and um, um, they decide to put Bob in the hospital. And I'm thinking, honestly, I really am thinking, this is because he's dehydrated. This is what you do. You know, if you throw up all night, it does not good. You're probably dehydrated. This is what we do. And I'll never forget this one little nurse that um, just grabbed my shoulder so gently and said, honey, this doesn't look good. And I'm like, okay. I, I just thought, well, he's got, you know, dehydration is not good. You know, we got this. And um, I see how the Lord tried to prepare me, and yet I just didn't really quite get it. So um, he went into the hospital, and uh, nine days later he passed away. And um, I tell you this, not because of the sadness of my husband passing away, which it is sad to me, but I tell you these stories because of the greatness of our God. That we have a God that no matter, it didn't go my way. Were we praying? Absolutely. There was the healing scriptures never turned off in the hospital room. There was the um, 
24-hour prayer meeting at the church where people got together and fasted and prayed on our behalf. There was the meet, you know, people all over Facebook praying. There was us crying out. We were believing. We were trusting God for a miracle. And it didn't go that way. It didn't happen my way. And I share those stories before because God's faithful there. And I share this story here because God's faithful here. He's 100% faithful. I don't like the situation, but I have a God who carries me through. I don't think it's fun, but I have a God who takes care of me. That just like in Job, when Job said, I knew the Lord, but now I know him. I feel like I knew God, but through life's journey, I know him. And just like David was a man after God's heart, I want to be a woman after God's heart. No matter what closes in around me, no matter what enemy tries to come after me, it could be an enemy of fear. It could be an enemy of unbelief. Whatever's happening in our life, no matter what that enemy looks at, that I'm a woman that puts my eyes on God and keeps going after him because I know that is where true help comes from. It's true help. It's true strength. It's 100% strength. I feel weak at times. I do. And I call upon my Lord who truly strengthens me, truly strengthens me and keeps me going. And there are... Um, there are people here that um, need to hear these stories because you feel weak. You feel like, I don't know if I can face this. I don't like this in my life. I'm not sure why this has happened to me. I don't like these things, but I'm telling you, put your eyes right on him where our help comes from because he's the God that can make the difference in your circumstance. I can't guarantee you you get your answer the way you want it, but I'm telling you you'll get the best answer because you get him. In all my life's journey and the different things that I've had to believe God for, all I can say is I know him in a greater way. I know him in a greater way. So my um, challenge to you is is to keep praying, keep trusting, keep believing, keep your eyes on him. We're going to end in a declaration of worship, proclaiming the faithfulness of our Lord, the strength of our Lord. And I, if you want to come forward and sing this before him, you want to move out of your seat and just bring whatever going on, what you've been meditating on, where you're at with the Lord, and bring it before him, I, I welcome you to come to the altars and cry out to your God where your help comes from, because he's the answer. Trust him at his word. Thanks for listening. We want to be a resource for you as you walk with Jesus. So please connect with us at radiantvicelia.com. Until next time. There is a heavenly city that I'm compelled to find. Oh, I love the flowers and trees and the smell of the grinding sea and all the beautiful things here in life. And I